whistle while you work. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. Don't sneak up on me like that. I only have so much air in this suit. And even all of the medical technology in the settled systems can't save me from death. Well, it's good to see you again, at least. <laughs> the last time I saw you, I think we were at some kind of seedy bar in Night City. Eh, anyway. Let me take a break here. Ugh. Ugh. Nothing like a sit down after a long day of mining, am I right? Oh, you admiring my cutter? She's a beauty, no doubt. You know, I once knew a man who conquered the entire settled systems using only this as his weapon. Some say he was living life on hard difficulty, where he couldn't use anything but the cutter. No companions, no ships, and certainly no throwables. Well, with, within reason, obviously. The settled systems, you know, like to throw curveballs at you, and sometimes you just can't avoid them. While I have you locked in place, uh, let me tell you the tale of our intrepid hero. Isaac Clark. Why, yes, he is named after the great Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. Or or maybe just the character from Dead Space. I guess it would fit the theme of, you know, using a industrial tool to kill people. Before I begin, a word of warning. This story will reveal many of the secrets the settled systems have, so be sure you want to listen before I continue. Alright, we good? Remember, no intermissions, so, uh, get your snacks now. You know, when I came up with the format for this story, I really didn't realize how much inference was needed. Huh. Keeping that fourth wall intact is really hard. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, I'll get back to the story now. Isaac started as a lowly miner, just like me, working for Argos Extractors. He and his team were sent to dig up a mysterious artifact by an unknown benefactor. Since he was the new guy, I guess they felt fine sending him in to get the thing. Isaac found the artifact, and upon touching it, he experienced some crazy visions. Hmm, I think my recollection may be getting crossed with something else. Oh well. After waking from his artifact mandated nap, Isaac was introduced to the benefactors who wanted the artifact. Oh, yeah, and it, it took him a few attempts to do so. See, the constructors of the settled systems work in mysterious ways. <coughs> Barrett, a member of the group Constellation, was the one who was sent to collect the artifact. However, upon hearing Isaac's story, he promptly handed over his keys and robot to our Green Dusty. But just as Isaac was getting ready to take his new ship, the Frontier, the Crimson Fleet pirates reared their ugly heads, and it was time for him to wield his weapon of choice for the first time. Thankfully, he was able to dispatch them easily. However, he was starting to notice that the biggest problem with the cutter was that it had terrible range and required you to stand still a lot. He decided he needed to train his skill in energy weapons so that one day he could set people alight. He also needed to master heavy weapons, but he needed more experience. Barrett decides to stay behind to help the other miners, while Isaac gets acquainted with flying a hundred ton death trap. This was one of the few times that Isaac had to use something other than the cutter to eliminate the enemy pirates. I mean, it was lasers, so you could say it's kind of equivalent, but not exactly called a cutter, so, you know. Showing an aptitude for flying, he eliminates them quickly, and then he heads down to the local moon to eliminate their boss. He cuts his way through the pirates, realizing that he will need a lot of medical supplies to get through his adventures. Plus, he knew from past experience that he would need to increase his security skill so that he could defeat more computers and locks in the future. He wanted to buff up his persuasion so that hopefully he could finish conflicts with words instead of with the end of a mining laser. He flexed his persuasive skills, calming down the bandit leader without any issues. But then he realized the loot that guy had was pretty juicy, so he decided to turn him and his gang into a fruit salad. With the pirates dealt with, Isaac headed to New Atlantis in the Alpha Centauri system to meet with his new compatriots at Constellation. 
He entered Constellation's Lodge using a watch that Barrett had given him, and meets the crew. Putting together his artifact with their other two, they discover there's something more to them than just coffee table pieces. So, their next goal was to collect more of these relics, and try and ascertain their purpose. Sarah, Constellation's leader, had heard rumors of a vanguard pilot that had acquired one of these artifacts. She suggested they go to Sidonia on Mars for more info, but Isaac had learned from past experience and his intuition that the pilot was last located on an abandoned shipyard above Earth's moon. Sure enough, there was a party going down on that station, and not the nice kind. Leaving Sarah behind to guard the ship, Isaac sped into the station, fighting his way through ecliptic mercenaries and spacers. He found a note deep in the station from the pilot that indicated his next stop was Neptune. Grabbing Sarah, they burned helium to Neptune and rescued the pilot from mercenaries that had taken control of his ship. The ship's weapons are powering up. Get ready. We're going to have to board. Target the engines. Once they stall out, we'll have our chance. That's it. He thanked them by handing over his relic, and they returned to the lodge. With this artifact successfully nestled with its brethren, Isaac decided he needed some real protection if he was going to secure the rest of these rarities. He had heard a tale from an ancient prophet known as Prima's Strategy Guide. that the infamous vigilante, the Mantis, was looking to divest some responsibilities. Of course, Spacers also wanted a piece of the pie, so Isaac had to fight his way through far more experienced enemies. He was able to improve some of his skills so that he could better damage them, but they still proved to be a challenge and completely drained him of his medical supplies. This man was at the mercy of the Mantis's legion of death bots, and well, the Cutter isn't well known for being good against mechanical menaces. After many, many attempts, he managed to secure the Mantis's ship and armor. Except the armor wasn't as good as some random armor he found, so yeah, kind of a waste. The ship, the Razorleaf, however, was well worth the time, with its strong shields and quick grab drive. It enabled him to escape any non-essential space combat, so now it was time to get the band back together and find Barrett. This also came with the bonus of procuring Heller's Cutter which is the only unique cutter in the settled systems. It was designed to be extra good against robots. Some scholars theorize that it was about 50% more effective than a normal cutter. With this new weapon in hand, Isaac rescued Heller and Barrett from the pirates, avoiding any major bloodshed. He also realized that he needed to make some quick credits to upgrade the razor leaf and armor, since he wasn't planning on planting roots on any outposts to store things in. So to earn that scratch, he stopped at the City of Neon, where he was able to sell excess goods and those pesky weapons. Don't want to use those, oh no, the cutter's where it's at, baby. Pockets full of credit chips? Baird and Isaac return to the lodge and meet with the rest of Constellation to discuss next steps. So to ascertain the location of the rest of the artifacts, they wanted to talk to Vladimir, the operator of the deep space satellite, The Eye. Being a member of Constellation himself, he was all too willing to help. Peering through the eye, Vladimir was able to find two other sites, while Sam Ko tagged along, mentioning that his family may have located one of these relics a long time ago. The first of these sites wasn't guarded at all, so once freed, the artifact plays its song and dance once more. The next artifact led Isaac to the last member of Constellation, 
and Dreja. She unfortunately wouldn't let Isaac boss her around, so he had no choice but to bring her along. Cutting their way through the spacers in the artifact's den, they secured the fourth artifact. Vladimir, the, the circumstances. Freestar Collective Space was next to come a Colin, and Sam Co. led Isaac to the Freestar City of Aquila. Here they needed to get something from the bank, but they were filming a western heist movie, so they had to ask them politely to leave so they could check the safety deposit boxes. Finding that Sam's dad had become a little vindictive, they had to make him see reason and use the ancestor's map to find the empty nest. This is the location that Sam thought that there might be an artifact. However, upon arriving, they found that a local outlaw gang was hiding out there, so it was time for Isaac to mine some blood once again. He secures the artifact, but is unable to peacefully deal with the outlaws, and must partake in the classic Mexican mine-off. Hmm, not sure about that one. I might cut that in my next storytelling. With Sam's family land successfully desecrated, Vladimir tells Isaac of a strange reading that he has found related to the artifacts. Isaac immediately jumps at the chance to investigate something new, and well, he gets superpowers, I guess. This was the only power he was given, and it would come in handy because it would suspend the laws of physics for a short time. Showing off his newfound skills to his friends, they get ready to find the next batch of artifacts. Walter of Eklund and Stroud asked for Isaac's help in the trade deal related to the relics. They traveled together to the city of Neon where they would meet the buyer. Using their cunning to prepare, they managed to talk the seller down in price and secure the piece. However, Walter didn't do his homework and they found the relic was actually stolen from a prominent businessman in the city. With the ship impounded and a bounty on their heads, the two went to seek out the businessman to try and rectify the situation. But as all things are in the settled systems, business is usually done at the end of a barrel, or in this case, the end of a laser emitter. You know, I'm not really up on how the uh, cutter actually works, but I would guess it's a laser emitter. They attempt to sneak past the guards with the help of Walter's wife. But Isaac is a bit impatient, and well, he fails to make it through without any bloodshed. They negotiate a truce and leave the city with the artifact in hand. They prepare to jump back to the lodge but are interrupted by a strange craft appearing out of nowhere. This craft claimed to be affiliated with the group calling themselves the Starborn, which kind of a lame name if you ask me, but I'm not a Starborn. They demanded the artifact be given to them, but Isaac punches the jump coordinates and gets out of there before the Starborn can attack. Wary of their new seemingly alien adversaries, Constellation sends Isaac out to collect more of the artifacts. This time when he collects them, he encounters more of the Starborn, who display resistance to his cutter and spout their own flashy powers. Luckily, he had mastered energy weapons now, and had some lovely spit roast Starborn for lunch and dinner, as my grandma always used to say. Oh, fate. I don't think she ever knew about the Starborn. Mm, this allegory may not work out. You know, forget, forget I said anything. Before heading for the next artifact, Vladimir asks Isaac and the others to help patch up the eye so they can better find the artifacts. Everyone chips in, but the eye exam doesn't go so well, and Barrett stays behind to help Vladimir with repairs. The next relic is being held by the Collector, who I would guess just ripped off the Marvel character of the same name, though the way less interesting collection. Like, who cares if you have an ancient fossil when you could have, like, a duck from an alternate dimension where everyone's ducks, and his name's Howard? That's pretty weird. Isaac has Sam stay and guard the ship while he tries to negotiate for the next piece. He had been training his persuasion skill for a moment like this, and he was prepared to slide his silver tongue over the smooth brain of the Collector. But of course, it turns out there were a few wrinkles still there, so once again he has to cut his way to the artifact. And he's really not good at persuasion. He secured the relic and flew back to the lodge with it in tow. Well, one minor distraction from the UC, but that's just a footnote here. We're not going to talk about that. Once back at the lodge, though, the Starborn launched a surprise attack on both the lodge and the eye. Isaac decided to stay behind at the lodge to protect the artifacts, but they were pursued by a Starborn called the Hunter. They 
make it to the spaceport, but at the cost of Barrett's life aboard the Eye. With their hearts heavy, they secured the artifacts aboard the ship and continued the search. Mateo was puzzled over words the hunter had said during the pursuit about something called the Unity. Whatever this was sounded like something he had heard from his local priest. They talk to the priest and learn of a tale about a pilgrim that visited the three biggest religions. Each religion had their own part of the pilgrim's tale that when put together turns into a map of the stars. This pointed to a specific place on the planet in the Indum system, where Isaac discovered an alien map pointing to a remote system. It seemed kind of pointless to point from a map to a map. Seeking further answers, he jumped to the system, only to find the hunter waiting for him with another starborn, the Emissary. However, they had come to parlay, revealing the truth about their goals, the artifacts, and who they were. Isaac was very perplexed, as one would be if you were faced with the fact that multiple realities were real, and one of your dead friends is also your enemy. They said they would leave him alone for now, and gave Isaac directions to find a secret base on Luna. Before going there, Isaac decided to secure the rest of the artifacts that Vladimir had located, and stumbled upon a research facility that was calling out in distress. This was another place that Isaac had heard about from the Prophet Prima, and had been training his security skill in case it was real. The facility was guarded by both creatures and robots, and while organics are weak against the cutter, machines are not. But with the security skill to open master locks, he would be able to unlock consoles controlling the robots, allowing him to disable them. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Once he entered the facility, he found that he was being transported between two realities, one where the facility was destroyed, and one where it was just in lockdown. He had to use this reality hopping to help him get to the lower levels where the scientists had been experimenting on one of the artifacts, causing the whole do -si do between two heavenly bodies. With the help of the inhabitants of the facility and the hopping, Isaac was able to make it downstairs. His goal was to try to avoid the robots guarding the area by either taking out the cameras, hiding in the alternate reality, or hacking their control terminals. He managed to do a good job with this, but his greedy hands kept him on his toes since he was trying to carry a bit too much. He was able to make it through to the experiment room and use the instructions left by the team to save both universes without much issue. He might have lost a few brain cells from lack of oxygen, but at least the robots were tamed. With the Pokedex complete, Isaac headed to the remote moon base that the Emissary had told him about. Because when the people who murdered your good friend put you on the run and had you bring all the objects thereafter to a remote, unsecure location, that's just fine. Fortunately, there was no ambush. Just a mysterious recording about the first grav drive being launched and how NASA secured the data needed for the drive from a mysterious source. And I know what you're going to say. It was an artifact, wasn't it? I mean, I could build it up, but yes, it in fact was an artifact that was used to get humanity out to the stars. Well, at the cost of the Earth's magnetic sphere, the entire planet, its ecosystem, the soul system really, mm, seems like a small price to pay, you know? After securing this top secret artifact from the depths of a decayed Cape Canaveral, Isaac was ambushed by the Starborn for real this time. This proved a bit of a challenge. The Starborn still proved to be resistant to the cutter. Eventually, he was able to make his way out of NASA's remains and right into the waiting arms of a moral dilemma. The Starborn demanded he either choose the side of the Hunter or the side of the Emissary. But he wasn't having any of it. He decided he didn't want to go on either of their sides. Dejected, the two Starborn left, vowing to protect their collection of artifacts from his grasp. Isaac was ready for them, though. Cutter in hand and the experience he'd gained along his journey. He set out to beat both Starborn. I mean, after a quick shopping montage, because... He wanted to make a ship better for against Starborn ships. You know, they are kind of advanced technology after all. Now we enter the penultimate chapter of Isaac's journey. He jumps into the system where the Emissary and the Hunter were waiting. A challenging fight between the Razorleaf and the Starborn ships commenced. With their enhanced firepower and shields, Isaac had little that he could do to defeat them. But there was one thing Isaac had over the other two. A single brain cell. He used the asteroids as cover, taking pot shots at the enemy until they fled to the planet's surface. He pursued them to a remote ecliptic base, where they had wiped out the platoon of mercenaries stationed there. Isaac gripped his cutter tightly, and fought with all his might against the Starborn.
He pushed his way slowly through the base, fighting off various starborn guardians until he reached one that could summon versions of him. Each version brandished their own cutter, and thus began what was dubbed as the Snail's Dance, where it was cutter against cutter, minor versus minor. Eventually, Isaac was able to best the Starborn creating his brothers, and pushed towards the buried temple where the Emissary and Hunter were waiting. This led to the last prophecy of Prima. You see, the Hunter and the Emissary are willing to hear what Isaac has to say, assuming he played his cards right. He had been training his persuasion skill for this very moment. He made sure to craft every word and every sentence with importance, holding against hope to reach the Starborn without having to fight them. Often at the end of the journey, you fight your strongest foes, or at least that's usually how it goes. So if Isaac could avoid fighting them, then he would have very much enjoyed that. However, his last words faltered, and he and the Starborn engaged in a fight to the death. After that long fight, Isaac stood above his bested foes and took back the artifacts that they had hoarded. With them nestled snugly in his backpack, he returned to the ship and installed them into the grav drive. He was ready for one final jump into the unknown. He held his breath and powered the grav drive. Oh god damn it! It was just Commander Shepard the whole time! Damn it! I totally broke this fourth wall! Why do I suck so bad at making characters?